Characters are what make a story for me. Similar to how I care about another person, a fleshed out character is effectually a person I care about, which elevates the story and themes of a work into the realm of emotional resonance that can impact me. So today, I wanted to talk about the characters that mean the most to me and allow their stories to mean the most to me. I will be trying my best to avoid spoilers, so me talking about these characters and the parts of their stories that best highlight them could be a great place to look for recommendations. If you have already experienced the story of one or many of these characters and want to talk to me about them with full context, leave a comment. Now, let's get into this. Kicking it off at number 50, we have Hisanobu Takahashi from the manga series Real. While at number 50, Takahashi is still a fantastic character and one whose story I think anyone could get into. A run-of-the-mill, arrogant jock type gets hit by a truck, paralyzing him for life. We watch him as he goes through the early stages of adjusting to his new life, all while confronting his flawed hierarchical perspective on people, his internalized ableism, and his relationship with his estranged father. Real is a story about wheelchair basketball, but more importantly, it is a story about the people who play wheelchair basketball. Number 49, Haruhi Suzumiya from The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya. Haruhi is often overshadowed by Kyon and sometimes Nagato in discussions of the series, but she is absolutely fantastic in her own right. At first, she appears to be a manic pixie dream girl type, but I think she avoids the worst parts of this trope. She is a deeply flawed person, often actively hurting those around her, but her central conflict is an understandable one. She is terrified of just being normal, that the world is as boring as it seems, and she is in no way special. Through her arc, we explore this philosophy, including how it is based on an unfulfilling means of finding self-worth, and what a better way would be, all while addressing how she is unfair to others. Number 48, Reen Tosaka from Fate Stay Night. Another character often overshadowed in serious discussion on the series, Reen, at least in the visual novel, is a complex human character. We get a detailed look into her perspective on life and how the events of her childhood, such as... spoilers... <laughs> <laughs> and being forced to become the head of her household at a young age with only a manipulative murderer to guide her. From there, we watch how her ideology clashes with Shiro's and makes her question her morality. Furthermore, in Heaven's Feel, we see how, spoilers, leads to a profoundly emotional and cathartic climax that brings her unique perspective that has been refined by, spoilers, to help her become the best version of herself. Number 47, Kenzo Tenma from Monster. Tenma is a strangely unique character. We see so many pure good protagonists that it is a tired old trope, but Tenma takes it to another level. He values human life so much that it really affected my perspective on the media I watched for a while. Seeing the world of Monster through his eyes lets us see the value of even the most minor of side characters' lives. It made me become disturbed by random deaths in the stories I experienced right after Monster. But more importantly, it adds a lot of weight to the journey Tenma goes on of deciding if he can live with himself for letting a serial killer live. The gravity of the act of murder he is considering in wanting to kill the serial killer weighed against the human lives that will be taken by the hands of the killer works so well because of how good a person Dr. Kenzo Tenma is. He is immobilized. Number 46, Subasa Hanakawa from Monogatari. With our first Monogatari character on the list, I feel obligated to warn that Monogatari is an uncomfortable work to watch with a pervert and I guess I'll try to have YouTube not be mad at me, so... Lollycon? 
in the lead role because I imagine these videos could be used as a way for y'all to find some really great stuff to watch. I would not want anyone who wants to completely avoid works that depict this shit, especially because the camera, camera is influenced by the main character's perspective. And there are a lot of scenes with disgusting framing to, so go and prepare. With that being said, I love Hanakawa's story for its exploration of the familial abuse she suffered and how that affected her image of herself Furthermore, we see her struggle with how her weak self-image led her to trying to fit into the main character's unreachable, objectifying, and idealized image of her. She is also the character in the Monogatari series that probably best uses the device of having the supernatural beings of the show's world representing her internal conflicts and psychological trauma. Number 45, Sasuke Uchiha from Naruto. I can't win with this one because I imagine everyone will either say he is way too high or way too low, but I do love Sasuke. I often talk about how the main two ways character development works for me is by logically laying out the process of their change or getting us invested in their relationships so we can feel that process along with them. While every character does both to some extent, especially those on this list, Sasuke is a very clear example of how both work. For anyone who is unaware, Sasuke is a part of the Uchiha clan, who make up an important part of the community in which our main cast grows up but are often treated as second-class citizens until his brother massacres the entire clan, except for Sasuke. As a small child, Sasuke is the only surviving member of his clan besides their murderer. With everyone he has ever known or cared about dead, except his brother, who he can no longer bring himself to love, Sasuke vows to live for the sole purpose of revenge against his brother. We watch as he uncovers more and more about the history that led up to the event that ruined his life, causing him to question the validity of his sworn revenge. We see the unconventional development of his relationship with Naruto, who lives in the same world and grew up isolated in grief just like Sasuke, establishing the foundation of their mutual understanding. Their emotionally charged adversarial relationship allows us to feel Sasuke's turmoil during the points where he is most conflicted while fighting Naruto. Number 44, Sodachi Oikura from Monogatari. Anyone who has watched the show likely remembers Sodachi for her brutal backstory of childhood trauma that only worsened as time went on. She participates in the idea of heroism that is so central to Monogatari's story, but on the side of wanting to be saved. Not being saved compounds her trauma, manifesting in debilitating hatred. In the post-anime, book-only arc, Sodachi Fiasco, we see her take center stage, completely separate from any of the characters we met before that point. With this, we experience a shift in our perspective of her as she gets to tell her own story rather than the main character. And she's a wonderful storyteller. Her narration is as engaging as it is insightful, fleshing out exactly how she thinks. In her new school, she finds herself dealing with intense social anxiety and self-loathing while being cast as the hero this time. Being on the other side of a situation similar to her own past situation makes her question the whole idea of heroism and better understand those from the life she left behind. Number 43, Eva from Autumn Sonata, directed by Ingmar Bergman. The film is about a woman who is still dealing with the grief from losing her son like a couple years ago, trying to reconnect with her mother despite the immense strain that has been placed on their relationship because of her mother's mistakes. Eva longs for some type of parent-child connection as she deals with her grief. Her childhood trauma 
and her slowly realizing that she may never be able to have that kind of relationship again. This film is mostly just Eva and her mother talking, which makes for an efficient character study, but it can also get tense with just how powerful the performances of Liv Ullman and Ingrid Bergman, who play Eva and her mother respectively, are. Number 42, Kagura Yato from Gintama. I'll try to save the general Gintama praise for a later entry that more fully embodies that, but Kagura definitely does all that stuff too. There is plenty of unique Kagura stuff with her family situation. I mean, I guess it's a spoiler, but not many 13-year-old girls with no family problems are just wandering around with no home, so I don't think her having a difficult family dynamic should come as a surprise. Avoiding spoilers is really hard in this video, though. I will say that she struggles between her broken family and the family she finds, and also how to view her blood family, especially when her found family is so much healthier. It comes as a bit of a shock to her, and that shock itself is another point of pain that she deals with. Number 41, E from Zarigoto. <sighs> another time where I can't win, because the Mega Vans would all put him top 5, and no one else has finished it but me. He is a great character, though. I won't get too into the answers to the mystery surrounding him but he blames himself for the catastrophe that has shaped his life since. Everything from his self-image to the people he can be around is shaped by this one event, and he has immense self-loathing for even being around to let it happen. In response to this, he essentially refuses to be an active member of his life. He feels others are the main characters, and he won't even voice his own opinions much of the time because they're worthless in his eyes. This can make his narration frustrating, but there are always double meanings to what he says, so we actually always do get insight into how he truly feels, and in the rare cases when his facade cracks, the way he describes his emotions can bring me to tears with just the description, even in isolation of how I feel about the situation. Zarigoto is a story about learning to be a person again. It's also a series of mystery novels, if that's your thing. Number 40, Gyro Zapelli from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Part 7 Steel Ball Run. I'll talk about it more later, but Steel Ball Run centers on each major character's relationship with their father. Gyro has the most normal relationship out of the three, but that comes with its own unique difficulties. Gyro must figure out how to feel about a father he has very conflicting feelings toward. What is there to love, what is there to hate, and can we do both? After working through these complex emotions, Gyro is unique within the cast by entering into a relationship where he is the father figure. The central question of his arc is how can he be a good father while understanding the limitations of the role? Coming in at number 39, I've got Princess Carolyn from Bojack Horseman. It is cool that I am talking about Princess Carolyn right after Gyro because we see her in a somewhat similar situation. She is a more multifaceted character, but one of my favorite things about her character is her relationship to the idea of motherhood. We see her have to deal with the difficulties of her relationship with her own mother, as the possibility of becoming one herself becomes more and more real. She's also dedicated to her career, so between that, feeling compelled to be a mother of sorts to Bojack, and the prospect of being a single mother, she has to balance all of the things she wants to do with her mental health and the limited time in a single day. Coming in at number 38, we have Michael Corleone from The Godfather. I have not seen the third movie yet, so this is mostly going off of the second one because it far outclasses the first for me. The parallel stories of Vito and Michael work wonders to provide insight into how Michael acts the way he does. 
We know the legend of Vito looms over him, and we see Vito's story from Michael's perspective. It is idealized, but when we see Michael do the same things throughout the film, it is disturbing. The way we tell a story and the legacy we pass to future generations can go as far as ruining their life as it does for Michael. This film questions the aggression and dominance we so often glorify, as well as the patriarchal way the legacy of stories like Vito's are passed down. Number 37, Shichika Yasuri from Katanagatri. Shichika is an extremely similar character to Michael, struggling with how his family's legacy weighs on him and suppresses his individuality. The Yasuri family's legacy is for the head to act as a sword? Conflicts from the past generations have shaped the world, and Shichika has been trained to act according to the will of another. He is a weapon to be wielded, not a person. Through the story of Katanagatri, we see Shichika slowly develop his humanity through forming a relationship with another person that we get to watch slowly become more and more passionate, and also by confronting the relics of the past and others who live a life dictated by them. How much agency do we have over our own lives and how much is predetermined by the circumstances handed to us by previous generations? Coming in at number 36, we have Nadako Sengoku from the Monogatari series. I'm sure you have witnessed a relationship that has an uncomfortable age gap. Nadako, a middle schooler, has a massive crush on the 18-year-old main character. While the main character does not reciprocate these feelings, he does enjoy the affection he receives from Nadako, so he keeps her around, but at an arm's length. The power he holds because of the age gap negatively influences how she sees herself as his messed up perception of her becomes so important to her and always being kept in relationship limbo prevents her from ever processing anything in a healthy way. He doesn't know her and doesn't care to, so his influence on her is especially brutal in how it stifles her individuality. Through the arcs told completely from her perspective, we see the toll all this takes on her, and we see her struggle to move forward and maybe find and re-embrace her own individuality and reject this influence that looms over her. Coming in at number 35, I have Kyon from the Melancholia Hari Suzumiya, the other half of the dynamic I described earlier while talking about Haruhi. Kyon is a bored kid who, unlike Haruhi, has fully accepted the mundanity of life. He lives a dull life until Haruhi comes into the picture. It is easy to see why I was worried this would be a manic pixie dream girl story, but Kyan and Haruhi start at two opposite extremes, neither one of which is the right way to live. They learn about each other and grow to care about one another, which is the true heart of the series. Maybe the world is secretly very exciting, or maybe it really is just as mundane as it seems, but does that even matter? These are not the things that drive us. Influenced by their relationship with each other, Kyan and Haruhi must realize what is truly important to them on their own. Neither does the work for the other. Number 34, Chito from Girls Last Tour. This manga is made truly special by the ending. But I can't talk about that. I can talk about everything else, though, because it does not exactly have a continuously developing plot. Girl's Last Tour follows two girls, Chito and Yuri, as they travel through the post-apocalyptic remains of their society. They run into a few people, but for the most part they are alone in a desolate world. They are always at the risk of death and are always looking for food. They have heard of a place where society lives on, 
and they're headed there, but the bulk of the story is just them existing in this bleak world. Contrary to everything I just said, it is a very relaxing read. Cheeto, especially, is very aware of how grave their situation is, but there is still life to live. Cheeto and Yuri explore the little wonders they can find and just hang out. It is peaceful and often fun to just see these characters experience their little joys. While this manga is not literally realistic, we also live in a horrible world filled with suffering and are in constant conflict between that knowledge and trying to believe in happiness. And that is what Girls Last Tour is about. Moving on to number 33, I have Yu Koito from Bloom Into You. This is the definitive teenage romance story. For many people, our teenage years are a time defined by constant change. I mean, we'd all always be constantly changing if our circumstances allowed us to, but that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> anyway, because of these changes many teenagers experience, it is easy to fear relationships that won't last. How could you possibly tell someone you love them when they might be a whole different person tomorrow? Yu struggles with this question as she considers the possibility of a romantic relationship. It is stifling to shut off a part of yourself out of fear it will only cause pain, especially when nothing can really eliminate that fear. Warning, this video is about to get mm, heavier, but we've been kind of heavy before, so, you know, if you can't handle talks of very bad mental health, then maybe stop here. Maybe. But, and that's okay. But, just a warning. Number 32, Shoya Ishida from A Silent Voice. A film that opens with our main character, Shoya, attempting suicide. Before he goes through with it though, he wants to tie up loose ends, including reaching out to the girl he mercilessly bullied as a child for being deaf. This sets our story in motion. After the period of bullying ended, Shoya ended up being ostracized by his peers, giving him intense social anxiety, low self-esteem, and newfound guilt now that he has had a taste of what he forced upon this girl. The film follows these two as they grow to understand each other, their unique struggles with communication, and the sources of their self-loathing. Naoko Yamada's direction is so perfect for this story, with her ability to convey emotion in unconventional ways and also the new technique she uses to show the obscuring of communication. This is my favorite work of hers, and one of my favorite works in general. Coming in at number 31, we have Rodion Romanovich Raskolnikov from Crime and Punishment. If you've spent any amount of time in some niche community with a lot of men, which I assume you have if you are watching a video mostly about anime, you've probably encountered a Raskolnikov. He is someone who sees many problems with the world, but instead of developing a nuanced understanding, he clings to the fantasy of greatness that was sold to him. He has a lot of resentment to those who he feels are stopping him from achieving his image of greatness he feels entitled to, and that resentment manifests violently. Crime and Punishment is a character study of a murderer. How did a seemingly normal person get to this point? What is the philosophy behind all of this? And most importantly, is there a way out? Moving on to number 30, we have Beatrice from Umi Neko. I'm skipping this one because literally everything is a spoiler. All right, cool. Coming in at number 29, we have Diane Nguyen from Bojack Horseman. We see Diane at many stages of her life as she consistently tries to reconcile her morals with her understanding of those around her, especially Bojack. Throughout all of this, she is a broken person, which is often what allows her to understand someone like Bojack. But these similarities cause so much pain. Can she be the person she wants to be despite all of the ways she feels she has been damaged? She feels this damage should make her a better person and be for the best, which is 
how she avoids the full weight of what she's been through, but everyone around her who has been through stuff are terrible people. Coming in at number 28, I have Tomia Okazaki from Clannad. Clannad is a pretty standard show about high schoolers, but throughout it all, we always have the strained relationship between Tomia and his father in the background, and the developing relationship between Tomia and the girl he likes his family more in the foreground. We watch as he learns what family is. What makes the show special comes after he graduates high school, though. We see Tomia go through much of early adulthood, including the prospect of starting his own family. His perspective on all of his family's shift as major life events happen, and he ends up in different roles within a family, giving him a greater understanding of what family is. There is more to this show, a lot more, and it goes to some very dark, very emotional places, but I won't go into that because spoilers. Number 27, Sakura Mato from Fate Stay Night. There is really not much to say that is not a spoiler because you know absolutely nothing about her for the first two thirds of the story. But once she gets a little more of the spotlight, we see her horrific past and her struggles to form meaningful relationships while having to wear facades and fear of the people she cares about most, blaming her for her trauma. She deals with learned helplessness and blaming herself for her trauma that has been ingrained into her by those responsible. Between that and dangerous coping mechanisms, she has a disturbing arc, but one that is deeply sympathetic and finds a cathartic resolution. Coming in at number 26, I've got Don Draper from Mad Men. There is an image of happiness that we're sold. Don Draper knows this image all too well. He has money, a beautiful wife that he cheats on with other beautiful women, two kids, a big house, and a prestigious job at an advertising agency where he sells this image to others. The only problem is he's miserable. Through a modern lens, Mad Men questions the ideals of the 60s and the capitalist and patriarchal values that their influence continues to force onto us today. Don achieved the ideal and is miserable, so even if you were to ignore the harm this system causes to those barred from even attempting to get what Don has, it would still be a system that's impossible to support. Of course, you cannot ignore any of that if you actually want to find a solution to that emptiness and isolation Don feels. Mad Men is the story of Don looking for the answers while going in circles because of the stranglehold these capitalist and patriarchal values have on our minds from a young age. 